A very, very warm welcome to the annual lecture for the College of Arts and Humanities here at UCD for 2022. And it's an especial pleasure to have people here in person tonight because actually we've had a hiatus of two years and I think we asked our speaker two years ago um, to give the lecture and we've had to wait this long because of um, intervening events which we're all um, familiar with. So especially delighted to see everyone here um, for the lecture uh, tonight. And especially delighted also that tonight it's the School of Classics. So it's the School of Classics' turn um, to be part of the annual lecture. And every year we have a different school, and I'll tell you a bit more about how it works um, in a moment. Classics, of course, is a key school in, in the college, um, and as well as its fantastic research and wonderful teaching, we're also very proud of the Classics Now initiative and also access Access Classics, which recently won the UCD Values um, in Action Award um, from members of the school, which was a fantastic achievement. Um, and we're very proud also of particularly the, the BA Humanities as well, which has an interdisciplinary pathway with Classics, which is extremely popular with students. And we're having some fabulous students come through that particular programme, as well, of course, as the, 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 um, the subject Classics itself. So... Um, Alex from the School of Classics is going to introduce our speaker tonight, but I want to just say a little bit about the lecture itself and the thinking behind it. It was set up in 2016 as a, an annual occasion to celebrate and showcase the college and also the disciplines that are um, in the college and arts and humanities um, more broadly. It's an event that we hoped would reach out to alumni and people interested in the college, friends of the college, to, to come to an event um, here. Also current staff, current students, current faculty. Um, so it was an event that we hoped would reach out to a broader community and show um, the excellence uh, of the disciplines um, that are represented in the college. And we're really excited to have been able to welcome a, a stream of very prestigious speakers. I'm very excited tonight as well, who also will be part of this celebration of our disciplines. Now, the first lecture, just to recap where we are so far in, in the cycle, was um, delivered by Paul Muldoon, um, the poet. And his um, lecture was um, The Blackbird, was on 18th century poetry. Um, from Ulster, which seems like another life ago, life uh, all the way back then um, when we had it. Um, the second lecture was um, under the auspices of the School of History, and we were delighted to welcome um, Linda Colley, who talked about um, constitutions past and present. And the third lecture, which was the last lecture before this one because of the two years in between, was for the School of English Drama and Film. And we're very pleased to welcome the novelist Sarah Moss, who talked about what we thought was the defining moment of our generation, which was, of course, Brexit. The title of her um, lecture was Feet in Ancient Time, Literacy in Literary Inheritance in the Age of Brexit. And of course, we've had another major event um, where people uh, haven't been talking about Brexit quite um, so much. So there are three schools that we've covered so far and how it works is that the college kind of sponsors the lecture but the school decides on the speaker and how they want to represent their discipline. And there are seven schools um, in the college. Um, so we have four schools and tonight it's classics which leaves three schools um, who will roll out in the next three years um, and they will be choosing the subject of the college annual lecture. But back to tonight, really excited to hand over to Alex to introduce our speaker. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Sarah. Um, it's my great uh, pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Isabel Torrent, who comes to us from Aarhus in Denmark. At Aarhus, she is Professor of Classical Reception in English and other modern European literatures and cultures. She's also the director of the Centre for Irish Studies and the principal investigator for the European Research Council funded project Classical Influences and Irish Culture. Originally from Dunleary, uh, Professor Torrance completed a PhD in Classics from Trinity College Dublin in 2004. Since then, she's had research and teaching positions 
in Trinity, in Maynooth, in Nottingham, and also at Notre Dame, where she had a tenured position in the classics department. In her research, um, she focuses on Greek tragedy, and five of her seven books are on Euripides and Aeschylus. More recently, she's started to turn towards reception. And her last book, published by Oxford in 2020, is entitled Classics and Irish Politics, 2016 to 2000, sorry, 1916 to 2016. And she's here at the moment in Dublin uh, to take part in a conference on Irish Platonism. So reception is an important part of classics. It allows us to be interdisciplinary um, and also to think about how the understanding of our subject has changed over time. Generally, the focus has been on modern literary receptions of classics, in particular Greek drama. Um, there's been a shift in focus in more recent years, um, thinking about, for example, the hedge schools and non-elite uh, reception to the classics. But um, Isabel Torrance takes things a bit further back. Uh, she takes things back to the medieval uh, period as well. And in her ERC-funded project, um, her stated objective is to look at the influences of Greek and Roman culture on Ireland uh, from the medieval period to the present day. So in tonight's talk, um, she's going to take us all the way back to the Middle Ages. And what she's going to show us is that the first Irish odyssey was not Joyce's Ulysses, but a Middle Irish folktale. Well, first of all, thank you so much to the Dean and um, Sarah and to Alex um, for the very warm welcome. Also to um, Emer, the two Michaels, Connor, um, for helping with the logistical setup. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here um, in person after um, being cooped up in my house for two years. Um, and yeah, I'll just um, get straight to it. Um, of course, um, I also need to thank the European Research Council for uh, funding the research that I'm presenting to you today. Um, if you want to know more about what we're doing after the talk, um, you can check out our website, click clic.au.dk. Um, also follow us on Twitter if you like. Um, if anyone happens to tweet about this lecture, um, we'd appreciate a tag. And um, as Alex mentioned, I'll be um, starting off talking about um, Joyce's Ulysses. I'll mention this Middle Irish folk tale, but I'm going to take us on a bit of a circuitous journey, um, which I hope will make sense. Um, looking at um, various uh, uh, examples of how Irish identity and classical culture have intersected over the centuries. Um, but in this centenary year of uh, the publication of Joyce's Ulysses, this novel seemed like an obvious place to start for a discussion of polyphony, Irish identity and classical culture. It's true, of course, that Joyce Studies has moved well beyond any reductive or mechanical application of correspondences from Joyce's um, so-called um, schema for Ulysses. Um, there it is in whole. Here is a um, zoomed-in version of the um, left-hand side of the page. Um, <clears throat> um, and we know, of course, that um, Joyce references um, a large number of sources beyond the canon of Homer, Shakespeare, Ibsen, etc. Um, new work by our postdoc on the project, Ronan Crowley, for instance, has shown through access to um, a vast array of newly digitized materials um, that Joyce references sources as far apart as Queen Victoria's diary um, to contemporary newspapers and ephemera that he would have encountered by chance in train stations and newsstands as he made his way across Europe um, with his family. But he was, of course, displaced by World War I from Trieste to Zurich to Paris as he was writing Ulysses, um, and as um, was recorded here in um, the first published uh, version. So while it's clear that Homer was far from being the only inspiration for Ulysses, 
Um, I would still suggest it's impossible to deny the significance of Homer's Odyssey for um, certainly the promotion of Ulysses, um, and also impossible to disentangle interpretation of Ulysses from its classical transformations. One example here, um, a poster produced in 1934 to advertise the first authorised American edition of the novel with this hook, How to Enjoy James Joyce's Great Novel, includes a reference, basically a reference to this schema um, uh, as a key to deciphering the work. Um, hopefully the low resolution um, doesn't obscure um, here this box, um, the characters in Ulysses, um, um, and uh, which provides the Homeric correspondences as well as real life counterparts of the characters. And I've just taken out one example. Um, Stephen Dedalus, uh, for instance, is Telemachus, son of Odysseus, and also Joyce at 22. And I must uh, acknowledge um, the assistance of Ronan Crowley for getting this slide. Um, now, it's certainly not my intention to get bogged down in the matter of Homeric correspondences in Joyce. Um, it's very easy to get tied up in knots if one does try to follow Joyce's own schema. Um, in one example, uh, for instance, um, if we look here, Joyce's counterpart um, for um, Menelaus on the third line here is Kevin Egan, there's a typo there. Um, a fictional avatar for Joseph Casey, who is Athenian involved in um, uh, revolutionary actions in the 1860s. Um, so this figure has nothing to do um, with the counterpart for Menelaus's wife, Helen, um, who is here on the second line, Mrs. O'Shea, that is Kitty O'Shea, the partner of Charles Stuart Parnell, who was in fact Mrs. Parnell by 1891 and who had passed away in 1921. We can also see Parnell himself here on the far right of the screen is um, uh, made to correspond with Agamemnon in the schema, um, which would make him Helen's brother-in-law um, rather than her husband. So you can see how it starts to get very messy. Um, but I want to make a point about um, the value and problem of the schema uh, being one and the same, essentially. In simplifying what Joyce does, the schema gives the reader something to grasp hold of in following the narrative, hence its value. At the same time, it risks obscuring the veritable intertextual web of connections both to Homer and to a myriad of other sources, hence its reductive nature. And this duality, clear reference and multi-directional complexity, is important because Joyce's novel um, captures both the significant cultural capital of classical antiquity in relation to Irish culture and the intrinsically protean or shape-shifting nature of associations with classical culture, which also, in more general terms, characterizes Ireland's engagement with the Greco-Roman past, as I hope to show in this talk. And I'll be um, bringing up a few famous names, Joyce being the first, um, but um, also focusing on more neglected Irish language texts, um, examples from material culture and um, women's voices. But to get back to Joyce, it was in the shadow of war, both at home and abroad, that Joyce chose to anchor his novel to an ancient epic that addresses the aftermath of war, the sufferings of exile, and the experience of migration, all three experiences familiar to various generations of Irish in Ireland and the Irish diaspora. In choosing Odysseus as his main referent, Joyce embraced the model of a notoriously multifaceted character. His most common epithet, um, polutropos, represents a real challenge for translators, literally meaning of many turns. It has been translated as everything from wily and cunning to complicated, with many more cumbersome options in between, such as of many devices, of many twists and turns, of many ways, etc. This sketch of Bloom by Joyce has the opening line of the Odyssey scrawled in Greek, including um, the epithet here. Um, uh, one of the only words, if I can see it correctly, that um, doesn't seem to have some uh, spelling or accentual error in it, um, but there it is. Um, 
Uh, and um, a final point I would like to make about Ulysses is that in Latinizing the title for his work from Odysseus to Ulysses, Joyce hints at Ireland's extraordinarily rich Latinate tradition from its earliest literature and monastic scholarship to the continued presence of, church, of Latin sorry, in the church services of pre-Vatican II Catholic Ireland, language which also, of course, features in Joyce's novel. This is um, significant in relation to Ireland's status as a British colony and its self-representation through classical sources. Classical education was a tool of the British Empire um, and a marker of so-called civilization. Ireland's history of classical learning, however, was both pre-colonial and of the highest caliber, a point to which I'll return. Um, so here we have some of the um, figures from the monastic and a philosophical tradition on the left um, and uh, the um, Middle Irish works on the right. And as I said, I'll come back to those. Um, Ireland thus had an indigenous claim of ownership to classical culture in a way other nations colonized by Britain did not. The tensions within this relationship to the classics are well brought out by a classroom textbook exercise um, in which school children were tasked with translating into Latin invented narratives about British suppression of Irish rebels. For instance, Latin prose composition for intermediate classes by North and Hillard, first published in 1895, translated into Irish by Magnus O'Donnell in 1937. Exercise 163 presents a group of unrepentant Irishmen who are brought to trial um, on the charge of stirring up revolution. As the exercise has it, quote, they asserted that they had done nothing contrary to the law of nations since the English were oppressing their land and they themselves were only trying to free her from an unjust dominion. So this is what the school children have to translate into Latin. In the aftermath of 1916, the conclusion of the exercise um, is not very prescient um, in imagining that um, the words of the young men displeased many who were present. But since the prisoners were young and had never before been accused of any crime, they were spared. Hence, um, in the classroom, the magnanimity of the British Empire is demonstrated in the face of Irishmen who are, quote, uh, not easy to govern, but whose insurgent nationalism might be tamed into a past Latinity in the copybook exercise. One wonders how Irish-speaking, essentially nationalist communities, would have responded um, to these exercises. Joyce himself may well have used the textbook, which was published when he was 13, um, but he must also have been aware of the Middle Irish Merigud Ulix Maclaritis, um, a short account of Odysseus' adventures in vernacular Middle Irish prose, with heavy inflections of the native Irish Imrev, or a voyage tale, which had been translated into English by the Celtic scholar Kuno Meyer and published in 1896. Notably, Ulix, the Ulysses figure, is a polyglot, um, quote, sharing in many a tongue, for he was wont to learn the tongue of every country to which he came, and to ask tidings of them in the language that they used. This reference to medieval Irish multilingualism might well have appealed to the multilingual and etymologically obsessed Joyce. This version, too, uses a Latinate form of the name Odysseus, Ulix, as was common in Middle Irish transliterations of classical names. By the 20th century, through the Irish language revival and the uprising to independence, it was with Greece um, that Irish figures most commonly aligned themselves. In a frequently quoted phrase from a 19, sorry, 1898 essay on the intellectual future of the Gael, Patrick Pierce declared, quote, what the Greek was to the ancient world, the Gael will be to the modern. Greece had repelled the imperial domination attempted by Persia, while Britain was easily and often self-consciously aligned with Imperial Rome. This issue of Imperial Rome remained a challenge for Seamus Heaney in translating his Aeneid, um, as you know, his final work. In a surviving fragment of the opening paragraph for an afterword to his Aeneid 6, Heaney had called it, quote, 
the best of books and the worst of books. Best because of its mythopoeic visions, the twilight fetch of its language, the pathos of the many encounters it allows the living Aeneas with his familiar dead. Worst because of its imperial certitude, its celebration of Rome's manifest destiny, and the catalogue of Roman heroes. Heaney refers here to the culminating section of Aeneid VI, where the shade of Anchises, Aeneas's father, reveals to his son a procession of future descendants destined to found and rule over Rome. In Heaney's opening translator's note, he references what he calls the grim determination that was required to translate this portion of Aeneid VI, putting on view, uh, sorry, putting on record his view that, quote, the roll call of generals and imperial heroes, um, the allusions to variously famous or obscure historical fi victories and defeats, make this part of the poem something of a test for reader and translator alike. Heaney thanks his Latin teacher, Father McGlinchey, by name in his Aeneid VI, and the close connection between Latinity and Roman Catholicism has been a further rich avenue for expressing Irish identity through classical languages and literature. Early 20th century Catholic priests were instrumental in translating classical literature into Irish and in producing Irish language editions um, of classical texts. One such figure, um, Patrick Deneen, best known as the compiler of the Irish English Dictionary, published a number of works on Virgil from the 1920s onwards. Deneen suggests a native ownership of the material um, uh, through Latin, sorry, through translation um, of Latin names into Irish forms. Um, so you can see here, for instance, um, Virgil, he has transliterated with an aspirated B instead of the normally used V, even though it's not a letter in the Irish language. Um, this is normally how it would have been transliterated. Um, Deneen saw himself, as Fia Cremagoroin has shown, um, as a latter-day Virgil, similarly dispossessed of his home, but engaged in the creation of a national literature, also calling his fellow citizens back to the land after periods of strife, as he saw Virgil doing in the Georgics. On the issue of Roman imperialism and Irish nationalism, Deneen attempted to reconcile the tension observed by Heaney in Aeneid VI, through a positive representation of the spread of Christianity and civilization under the Roman Empire, reading Anchises' exhortation to, quote, spare the vanquished and conquer the proud, in a famous passage at the end of Aeneid VI, as a benign form of um, Christianizing imperialism, if that's uh, a phrase we can use. Um, and this notion of a counter-colonial and anti-British Latinity in Ireland can be traced back to the flight of the Earls in 1607, when leading Catholic families from Ulster went into permanent exile to other Catholic countries on the continent following the Ulster plantations. From the continent, the Latin language and classical learning were weaponized to promote dissent and an alternative to colonial narrative. As Jason Harris and Keith Sidwell observed in their volume, Making Ar Ireland Roman, the ethnic, cultural, and religious divisions within Ireland during this period produced a divided Latin writing and reading community. Celebrating one's patria was a classical topos widely adopted by humanists across Europe. In Ireland, it combined with the nostalgia of exile and the exigencies of Catholic propaganda to create a national myth of oppression. Protestant writers in Ireland, such as Archbishop Usher and the poet Dermot O'Mara, employed Rome as a model of classical civility and erudition in line with a notion of British imperial Romanitas. Catholic writers, on the other hand, consistently aligned Rome with Catholicism. Successive penal laws, moreover, prohibiting and curtailing Catholic education in Ireland from the 17th century onwards, drove the education of Irish Catholics either to the continent or to the illegal hedge schools mentioned by Alex, um, which um, as Laurie O'Higgins, uh, sorry, uh, yes, Laurie O'Higgins has recently documented in her meticulously researched The Irish Classical Self. Um, um, Greek and Latin were regularly taught 
often through the medium of Irish from the late 17th to the 19th centuries, um, as famously referenced, of course, in Brian Friel's um, translations. Um, and hedge school teachers were frequently priests or men who had trained as priests but had not followed through to ordination. But Latin humanism in the early modern period is only one part of the story. Irish language poetry is another. Um, as leading Irish poets produced work lamenting dispossession and exile, often through recourse to classical exempla. Um, Gregory Darwin, one of our um, Click Project postdocs, who's now senior lecturer and um, head of Celtic studies at the University of Uppsala, has recorded all the information on early modern Irish poetry, over 100 often very lengthy poems in our project database of classical allusions in Irish literature, which is under construction but can be searched um, on our, through our website. This is the interface of database 2.0, which is about to go live, but database 1.0 is still um, available to be searched on um, the website. Um, yes. Two recurring motifs um, in this body of literature include comparisons between patrons and classical heroes and the comparison of a personified female figure of Ireland to classical goddesses. For instance, um, the 1607 poem More and Lucht Archery Era by um, Fergal Oak Machen Ward in 39 quatrains. The poem is addressed to Cúchanacht Oak Maguire, the last of the Maguire chiefs of Fermanagh who left Ireland by boat for Spain that year. The poem features um, an extended comparison between the Gaelic nobility um, who left on their ships and the Greeks on the Argo who sacked Troy under Laomedon's reign. So that's the first sack of Troy led by Heracles. And the poet predicts that later Gaelic nobles imagined as Gregi, Illa and Naimshara at the end of Quatrain 33, other Greeks of their time, um, will return to Ireland to reconquer it. Five years earlier, the same poet, Fergal Oag, had composed um, an elegy um, for A. Rue O'Donnell, um, Hugh O'Donnell, eldest son of Hugh O'Donnell, the ruling lord of Tyrconnell, who had died of a fever in Spain in 1602, um, after being driven into exile, also following numerous campaigns of rebellion. The poem, Tasta Eris in Asborn, um, 69 quatrains long, contains two apologues, one on the death of Hercules, um, which is on the slide here, um, and one um, on Caesar. In the first, the ignoble circumstances of O'Donnell's death are contrasted with the death of Hercules, who was buried with his weapons. Um, and in the second, um, I just put the opening section and the closing section. You could fit the whole thing on slide. Um, but in the second um, lengthy example, O'Donnell is compared repeatedly with Caesar as a military figure who did not live long enough to enjoy the fruits of his victories. Despite his victories, O'Donnell was unable to live long enough to enjoy the kingship of Ireland. Um, in another example here um, by the poet um, Donal uh, Macon O'Dolly since Spawn the Torna Tower, composed in 1618 as an elegy for Donal O'Sullivan Beer, who was the last Prince of Beer on the Beira Peninsula and had been assassinated in Madrid while in exile that year. O'Sullivan Beer's defense of Ireland is compared to Hector's defense of Troy. While Hector was alive, Troy could not fall. Similarly, Ireland is now vulnerable, literally without a spouse, um, after the death of her staunch defender. And if you want to hear more about um, Hector, um, you can tune in on 17th of May um, to the Classical Association of Ireland's lecture, is that right? Um, uh, where Gregory Darwin, our former postdoc, will be presenting. Um, but so Ireland is without a spouse because of course she is personified as a female figure. And this is the second trend we can observe in the early modern Irish poetry of comparisons between a personified Ireland and a Venus or Minerva, um, also Helen, um, which occur from the mid 17th century. 
Um, so, for example, in this poem, De Frih Manuur and Uinsha er Aaron, um, composed by Donica Macken um, Kiel Eakley, I think that's how you say it, but I'm not 100% sure, in 1640. Um, and, and you'll notice there's no translation on this one. That's because it hasn't been translated, and I'm not confident enough to uh, post one myself. Um, so I've just put the words in bold where you can uh, follow along with uh, what's going on. Um, this laments, again, the downfall of the Gaelic aristocracy following the plantation of Ulster. Ireland is personified as a beautiful woman who resembles Venus, Minerva, and Helen of Troy. And the poet refers to the Greek origin of the ancestors of the Gaels, um, their wanderings through the Mediterranean before reaching Ireland, an ostensible reference to the Fir Bullock of medieval Irish literature. And these were mythical refugees who had left Ireland, lived for centuries in Greece, um, then returned to Ireland and been driven west to the Aran Islands where they had reputedly built um, the forts um, such as Dune Angus, etc. Um, and in another example, um, the anonymous on Siegi Rovonok, the Roman fairy, composed in 1650, this one to lament the death of um, Owen Rua O'Neill in 1649. The poet visits the graves of um, Hugh O'Neill and Rory O'Donnell in Rome. There he beholds um, a vision of a beautiful woman, so it's an Ashling poem, who is likened to Venus and Minerva. She laments the present state of Ireland and her nobility, as well as the untimely death of Owen Rua, and prophesies that the Gaels will rise again to expel foreign invaders. And the poem is about 150 lines long altogether. So I've just put the opening relevant section on, on the screen. Um, it's also in the 17th century, towards the end of the century, that we first find representations of Ireland as the classical personification Hibernia, which still adorns major landmarks in Dublin, such as the GPO and the Custom House. Um, new research by another one of our postdocs, Kieran Rua O'Neill, traces the image back to coins minted by Jacobite, Jacobite forces during the 1691 siege of Limerick. The Hibernia figure is inspired by ancient Roman coins featuring a personified Britannia, which um, were these coins first being produced to commemorate the visit of the Emperor Hadrian to Britain in 122 CE. And it was at the end of the Williamite War in Ireland, uh, which uh, lasted from 1688 to 1691, Coga and Dori in Irish, fought between the supporters of the deposed Catholic James II and the supporters of his successor, William III, that um, this garrison of Jacobite forces, low on currency during the 1691 siege of Limerick, struck a series of new coins featuring Hibernia with the date 1691. That was the same year in which the Treaty of Limerick ended the war in Ireland. In her right hand, as you can see, um, Hibernia holds a cross, um, arguably a representation of the Catholic faith of the island, um, with her left arm resting on a harp. Hibernia continued to appear on coins into the 18th and early 19th centuries, and unlike the lamenting female figure of Jacobite poetry, as in the examples I just mentioned, the visual representations of Ireland as Hibernia were characterized by a sense of determination and assertion of political equality with England. Nowhere is this more obvious, perhaps, than in her sculptural representation on Dublin's late 18th um, century custom house, um, which was completed in 1791, created by Irishman Edward Smith. Um, in a recent presentation, Kieran Rua O'Neill, um, our project postdoc, um, discussed how Smith was responsible for the majority of the carvings in the innovative sculptural program of James Gandon's architectural project, which reflected the assertion of Ireland's commercial control of her imports and exports. So Hibernia and Britannia, um, as personifications of Ireland and Britain, um, feature in the um, center of the building's pediment here, and are represented as equals. The zoomed up version is low resolution, but at least you can see a bit more clearly here, Britannia and Hibernia. Um, each figure is crowned and represented with distinguishing attributes. Hibernia is accompanied by her 
winged maiden harp. So you can see this is a, a winged female figure here in the construction of the harp. Um, Britannia is accompanied by an olive branch, Phrygian capped spear and shield emblazoned with the Union flag. And the inclusion of a winged maiden in the Irish harp that accompanies Hibernia is another common feature which is also of classical origin, evoking classical images of sirens, um, a connection that is overtly acknowledged by Thomas More, also known as Anacreon More, for his borrowings from the classical Greek poet Anacreon. Um, uh, in his 1810 song, The Origin of the Harp, um, here in this illustration uh, by Daniel MacLeese, and I'm grateful to Kieran Rue O'Neill for sharing this slide with me, uh, but you can see it says, "'Tis believed that this harp which I wake now for thee was a siren of old who sung under the sea." Hibernia and the winged maiden harp emerge as, a power, as powerful personifications of Ireland that were accepted by figures and groups of varied Irish identities, by Catholics and Protestants, by the English establishment, and by Irish nationalists. A green flag with a winged maiden harp, um, for instance, had been used by Owen Rue O'Neill and the Irish Catholic Confederation from 1642. Ireland, Hibernia, Erin, always female personifications. But it is by now well acknowledged that the Irish literary scene has been unduly male dominated and that this is not just a matter of circumstance, but one of exclusion and erasure that needs to be addressed. I'm sure I don't need to explain um, here the furore over the lack of female authors represented in the original three volumes of the Field Day Anthology of Irish Literature, of Irish Writing, excuse me, um, which led to two additional tomes dedicated to women writers amounting to a mass of 3,200 pages published in 2003. Um, but the issue of exclusion persists, and again, I don't need to um, explain this one to you, the Waking the Feminist movement of 2016, a politicized response to the male-dominated centenary program of the, of the Abbey Theatre. And the same can be said of classical reception studies of Irish authors. Um, and here are some names in no particular order. Oscar Wilde, W.B. Yeats, James Joyce, John Millington Singh, Louis McNeese, Seamus Heaney, Michael Longley, Brian Friel, Frank McGuinness, Derek Mahan, Peter Fallon, Tom Paulin, Brendan Kennelly, Colm Tobin, Carlo Gebler, Colm Teven, um, Colin Teven, excuse me, Owen McCafferty, Aidan Carl Matthews, Desmond Egan, Paul Muldoon, um, our um, uh, distinguished inaugural speaker of this series. All these well-known and well-studied male Irish authors have rewritten classical literature to a greater or lesser extent. So where are all the women? Well, one obvious answer is a UCD alumna, Marina Carr, um, who holds a lot on her shoulders, repeatedly singled out as a female playwright rather than simply a playwright, which she has discussed as a source of mild irritation to her. Um, she is the exception that proves the rule on the difficulty of making it as a female author on the Irish literary scene, specifically in the theatre. Um, Carr's work is characterised by a fearless engagement with imposing titans, Shakespeare, Ibsen, Chekhov, and of course the Greeks, who may well be her most frequent source of um, inspiration. Her adaptations of Greek tragedy turn a spotlight on some of the ugliness of social politics in Ireland in By the Bog of Cats and in Ariel, and on more generic questions of humanity, monstrosity, and trauma of various kinds in Phaedra Backwards, Hecuba, Girl on an Altar, I Girl, and um, I think we can assume also in The Boy, which has been postponed. Edna O'Brien also turned her pen to Greek tragedy, producing an adaptation of Iphigenia, which underlines how Iphigenia's sacrifice, although heroic, fails to halt the machine of war. And we could say that the fate of women in war is a theme explored um, also in several of Carr's tragedies. The late Ivan Boland is another hugely important figure whose work frequently re reanimated classical tropes 
um, but which has not been studied sufficiently in this regard. Boland's poetry seeks new ways to accommodate women's voices through classical illusion within a male-dominated canon. Athena's song, for instance, um, imagines Boland herself as Athena transferring her sphere of activity from warfare to song and pipe music, but whose song becomes muted and lost. The poem can be read as a cipher for Boland's own awakening to poetry and experience of exclusion. As her career progressed, the Roman poet Ovid would become a significant source of inspiration. The 1982 poem, Daphne with her thighs in bark, is based on the transformation of Daphne into the laurel tree to escape the unwanted sexual advances of the god Apollo, as told in Ovid's Metamorphoses. The title, um, Daphne with her thighs in bark, quotes a line of Ezra Pound, thus placing the poem in direct conversation with male authorship. Boland's poem gives Daphne a voice as a housewife now trapped in her kitchen who regrets having fled from the god. As a comment on women's agency over their own sexuality, the poem shares a perspective developed further in Marina Carr's Hecuba, for instance, where the Trojan women are all sexually active and unashamedly so. Like um, Seamus Heaney, Boland also found inspiration in Virgil's Aeneid, but from a feminist perspective, most importantly in the title poem of her 1986 collection, The Journey, which rewrites the visit to Hades of Aeneid VI through the structure of an Irish Ashling poem. Um, Sappho appears as a guide to the underworld where the hardships endured by contemporary mothers, normally overlooked, become a central focus. The complexities of motherhood um, are given further expression in Boland's work through the figure of Ceres, Demeter, goddess of agriculture, and her daughter Proserpina, or Persephone, whose abduction by Hades causes Ceres, Demeter, such grief that she withholds harvests from the earth until her daughter is allowed to return, thus explaining the cycle of the seasons. Winter coincides with Persephone's absence um, from the earth and with her mother's grief. And again, it is to, Bo to Ovid that Boland turns for the source material. In the first iteration of this myth in Boland's poetry, which appears in um, the 1990 poem, The Making of an Irish Goddess, the loss of harvests is connected to the Irish famine, and a domesticated version of the goddess Ceres is reimagined as a middle-aged 19th century mother, and then applied to the poet's own experience of motherhood. The pomegranate, um, uh, again dealing with the same myth, mediates a reflection on the poet's developing relationship with her teenage daughter. Um, while Ceres looks at the morning, completes the cycle with an aging mother now accepting the separation from her daughter and musing on where she came from and what she will become. In more recent collections, Ovid remained a consistent point of reference. Philomela, um, whose tongue is cut out uh, to prevent her from reporting her rapist in classical mythology, is the focus of silenced in domestic violence. And the poem Eurydice Speaks, in A Woman Without a Country, relates the myth of Orpheus from Eurydice's perspective. The same collection opens with a section and poem entitled Song and Oops, Song and Error, um, a reference to Ovid's Carmen et Error, um, uh, ostensibly alluding to the reason for his banishment from Rome, as related in his Tristia. In the poem, Boland expresses her love of Ovid and identifies with his experiences of exile. The pioneering importance of Boland's work, I think, cannot be overstated um, in how she has inspired, arguably, numerous subsequent female Irish poets. Certainly, the myths of Daphne, Demeter, and Persephone, and the poet Ovid himself, have continued to inform the work of female Irish poets. Um, Nuala Gonal's 2000 collection, Water Horse, features the poem Daphne August Apollo, translated by Maeve McGuckian, which, like Boland's Daphne with her thighs in bark, toys with the idea of accepting Apollo's advances. Persephone, in the same collection, also translated by Maeve McGuckian, like Boland's The Pomegranate, presents the inevitability of Persephone's abduction by Hades in a modern version. 
Mary Maddox collection. Um, uh, Demeter Does Not Remember from 2014 is a sustained engagement with the Demeter and Persephone myth. Emily Cullen in Daphne's Repost gives Daphne a voice and assertive agency in response to Apollo's lust. Um, Eileen Nikulanon, um, who has references to Ovid in her 2020 collection The Mother House, has discussed how she used to teach a course on mythology and folklore, starting with Ovid. And the motif of exile um, uh, inspired by Ovid appears also in um, Catherine Ann Cullen's 2019 poem. Oh, sorry, that's Eileen Nikulanon. This is Catherine Ann Cullen. Um, in her poem, The Measure of My Song, and in Tara Bergen's 2020 Ovid 19, obviously a play on COVID-19. Um, these brief examples merely represent a scratch on the surface of a wealth of classical references in contemporary Irish poetry by female poets. In other male-dominated areas, too, women's work awaits a further acknowledgement and study. The myth of Sophocles' Antigone for instance, has been adapted and evoked so often by Irish authors and directors that it might be in the running for the title of Ireland's national play. Conor Cruz O'Brien, Tom Paulin, Brendan Kennelly, Aidan Carl Matthews, Conal Morrison, Seamus Heaney, Owen McCafferty, Jared Humphreys, Carlo Gebler all spring to mind. But contemporaneous with Tom Paulin's 1984 The Riot Act is Pat Murphy's Anne Devlin. Um, which was re-released in 2019, and is at least Poland's equal in pioneering a politicized Irish framework for the Antigone story. So in Murphy's case, this is the 1798 rebellion as the context, rather than the Troubles, which is the context of Poland's um, play. But on the Troubles, um, Stacey Gregg's 2006 Ismini, although unpublished, is a masterful example of teasing out the awful complexities of violence in Northern Ireland as a lived experience um, and in exploring the impact on survivors. And let's not forget the real life Bernadette Devlin Michalski, um, who inspired both Conor Cruz O'Brien and Tom Paulin in very different ways in applying the Antigone myth to Northern Ireland. In other moments of significance, celebrated Irish um, language poet Moira Wakanthi played Tiresias' attendant, aged four, in the Irish language production of Antigone, written by her uncle, Padraig de Bruyne, a cleric who translated numerous um, works of uh, classical literature and other literature into Irish, but, but a lot of um, classical texts. Um, in a production, an Irish language production, which, according to reviews, delighted Irish-speaking audiences in 1926. Earlier still, a Lady Wilde, mother of Oscar, rallied the Antigone figure to the nationalist Irish cause in the Nation newspaper following the acclaimed performance of Helen Fawcett as um, Antigone in Dublin, um, which is commemorated by, uh, was commemorated by Frederick William Burton in this watercolour um, here that you can see at the National Gallery in Dublin. On the subject of Greek tragedy, Christine Longford, patron of the Gate Theatre, an accomplished classicist, translated Aeschylus's Eumenides for performance at the Gate Theatre in 1933, a few years after producing her first book on Vespasian. Nuala Nigonal has recently completed an Irish language translation of Aeschylus's Persians. To take a different track, the model of Sappho links a diverse variety of Irish women. The 18th century Irish language poet Moira Nihruli, for instance, um, was lamented on her death by three contemporary male poets as the Sappho of Munster in acknowledgement of her poetic achievements. Radical feminist Eva Gore Booth and her partner Esther Roper were pioneers in finding acceptance for same-sex relationships through the poetry of Sappho. And Katrina Niclerkeen has recently published a collection of Irish translations of the poet poems of Sappho. I could easily go on. Um, Kathleen Dove, Catherine Phillips, Dorothy Smith, Constantia Grierson, Olivia Elder, I've got to turn over the page here, Mary Tighe, picture of her, 
Lady Morgan, got a picture of her. Margaret Heavey, got a picture of her. Um, I'll just mention two women on this list um, uh, for reasons of time, um, but happy to talk about any of the others in, in the questions. Um, Catherine Phillips, um, a royalist Anglo-Welsh poet. Uh, Phillips moved to Dublin in 1662 to pursue her husband's claims to Irish estates. And in February 1663, her celebrated English verse translation of Corneille's Pompey was performed in Dublin to great acclaim. Phillips's Pompey, um, using the classical model of the Roman general Pompey, raised complex political questions in a Dublin context regarding contemporary rivalries and land claims where Pompey could be read both as an exiled and beheaded ruler and as a defender of the Republican Senate, evoking the figures of Charles I, Charles II, and Cromwell simultaneously. And the other example I'll mention from the list is Olivia Elder. Um, she was the daughter of an Ulster Presbyterian minister, and so among the Protestants labelled as dissenters by colonial officials. Um, she was radically outspoken for her time, regularly called out specific clergymen in her poems for hypocrisy, greed, lying, and fornication. She was dissatisfied with male suitors, experimented with female int intimacy, but no romantic relationship could ultimately meet with her approval. She had an exceptionally sharp tongue, and I'll just read you a brief um, quotation from a scathing poem that she wrote about a corpulent friend called Helen. Um, but perhaps, sorry, but here perhaps you'll tell me, Pat, the Grecian beauties were all fat. It's true, but yet we may suppose Dame Helen did not fill her hose, nor yet her stays so well by half or she had only raised a laugh instead of raising Greece's ire and setting men and gods on fire. So if that's how she treats her friends, you know, you wouldn't want to get on the wrong side of her. Um, but I'll now um, start drawing some conclusions. I'm aware that in highlighting the multiplicity of Irish authors and individuals who have appropriated classical culture for various expressions of identity, I have not been able to do justice to individual cases. My aim has rather been to show the extraordinary diachronic and polyphonic wealth of such engagements. At the beginning of the talk, I mentioned, and Alex mentioned, the first Irish odyssey not being Joyce's, but the middle Irish folktale Merigud Ulix MacLertes. And I'll now conclude with a word on medieval Ireland and on issues of shifting or hybrid identities. So um, classicists and Celticists alike tend to be stunned when confronted with the sheer volume of medieval Irish sources that rewrite, adapt, and translate classical literature, as you can see on this list. And some of these texts are extremely long. Some are quite well known. Others remain unedited and translated. And even those texts that have been studied are, um, generally speaking, now in desperate need of updated editions and scholarship. For those of us who cannot read Middle Irish, the texts are essentially inaccessible. Um, so I'm delighted to share the news that our project with our research affiliates and network in medieval Irish studies is preparing an anthology of these texts to be published with translations and accompanying <laughs> explanatory essays um, uh, in, uh, in a contract that we have with Bloomsbury, which of course will be open access because it's funded by the European Research Council, due to appear in 2023 um, or four. I mean, a significant number of these medieval texts, the ones in bold um, font, deal with the Trojan War. Um, and a distinctive feature of these Irish versions uh, recounting events at Troy, or purporting to recount events at Troy, as Michael Clark has discussed, um, is that the Trojans are often uh, presented very negatively. Um, at the opening of Imhachta Aeneasa, for example, the, dubbed the Irish Aeneid, the Adventures of Aeneas, adapted from Virgil, Aeneas is presented as a traitor. And these negative representations of the Trojans, uh, Michael Clarke explains, is because the Irish, unlike other European cultures, did not claim descent from Troy. As far back as the medieval period, then, classical literature has featured in Irish culture as a means of expressing, mediating, or negotiating identity. 
that identity is not fixed and it is not singular. Catherine Phillips is both an Anglo-Welsh poet and a woman newly negotiating control of her husband's estates in Ireland. Olivia Elder is both a dissenting Ulster Presbyterian and a woman negotiating personal relationships. Patrick Deneen appropriates Virgil to Catholicism, to Irish nationalism, and to the Irish language. He explains that the Irish language is far better suited to translating Latin than English is. The application of the Antigone myth to Northern Ireland marks Conor Cruz O'Brien's notorious shift from nationalist to unionist politics. Ivan Boland's Mining of Ovid expresses her experience um, as an Irish woman and also as an Irish exile. Nuala Nigonal translated Aeschylus's Persians into Irish, conscious of the play's resonances in the centenary commemorations for independence, um, as um, an ambassador for the Irish language, as a female poet, um, but also as the widow of a Turkish man whose land included the Eastern Greeks of Asia Minor, and ancient Persia. It's important that Aeschylus presents his Persians with great empathy for their suffering, even as their defeat by the Greeks is a triumphant David and Goliath story. So these are some deeply personal engagements with classical, classical culture that underscore the hybrid identities of their creators. In other instances, recourse to the classical has promoted a transcendence of sectarian boundaries. The winged figure, um, sorry, the figure of Hibernia um, with her winged maiden harp as a classicizing personification of Ireland um, and the harp inspired by classical sirens, um, as I have mentioned, were accepted by nationalists, Catholics, Irish Protestants, and by the English establishment. Irish engagement with Platonism similarly bridges political and sectarian divides dating back to Eriugena in the 9th century or earlier still, um, as argued by one of our postdocs, Daniel Watson, who is looking back to texts from the 7th century in uh, medieval Irish. And um, as uh, Alex mentioned later this week, starting on Thursday, a conference organized by Daniel is hosted here in Dublin at the Institute of Advanced Studies, um, where we hope to uncover how Platonism increasingly became a common language um, shared by Irish intellectuals of many different interests, political ideas, and religious commitments. To conclude then, I hope to have shown that classical culture has always been and continues to remain a powerful vehicle for expressing Irish identities in all their complexities, and that far more work deserves to be undertaken in this area. There are Irish identities that I have not been able to address today, such as the Minkeri, Irish Indian, Irish African, and numerous other hybrid and immigrant Irish communities. I do believe that classical reception has a powerful potential to be an all-inclusive field. Um, we know that Marina Carr's um, By the Bog of Cats, her adaptation of the Medea story, um, uh, points out discrimination against um, the Minkeri um, as through her Medea figure of Hester Swain, who is um, from the traveling community. But the folk tales of the Minkeri bear resemblances to the fables of Aesop, which have also long been appropriated into an Irish context by Irish language speakers and used in Irish language education. So you see this, um, the Irish version here, Aesop Ahonic Geheran, Aesop came to Ireland is not quite the same as Aesop's fables in Irish. But, um, and here, Aesop in Connemara, Aesop in Connemara, there is this an idea of um, appropriating this kind of um, fable um, to Irish culture. Um, on Ireland and India, oh, I, I suppose I, my point was, I think this is a, something worth investigating. I don't have any further pearls of wisdom on it myself, but it's something that has occurred to me. Um, on Ireland and India, Indian philosophy was a crucial part of the Neoplatonist belief system filtered through the lens of Irish mythology that was espoused by the eccentric but extremely influential George Russell, A.E., whose treatise on Irish politics, The National Being, inspired by Plato, first published in 1916, was greatly admired by Mahatma Gandhi, with whom he enjoyed an intellectual friendship. And if you want to hear more about um, A.E. and Platonism, you can 
again come along to this conference <laughs> um, later in the week. Um, and similarly, W.B. Yeats and Rabindranath Tagore, who knew each other, Tagore also knew George Russell, of course, um, shared an appreciation of the cultural significance of classical languages and literature for nation building in the wake of post-colonialism, as being discussed by Carl O'Brien. Um, and on Africa, Nigeria, we could say, like Ireland, has um, a tradition of rewriting Greek tragedy, um, which invites comparison in a post-colonial context. Um, my labels seem to have disappeared in one of the versions that I saved, but you can see the names of the um, authors here on the, the works. Um, um, on the left-hand side, famous examples include Ola Rotimi's Oedipus play and novel The Gods Are Not to Blame um, from 1968 and the novel from 1971, and then Nobel Prize winner Wole Soinka's Back Eye Tragedy, A Communion Rite, um, first published in 1973. So these are just a few possibilities um, to be explored. And our project team is doing its best to move forward with the research but we are literally drowning in material. So I would like to take this opportunity to issue a clarion call for more students and scholars to consider this kind of intersectional and interdisciplinary research, and for colleagues um, to consider including more of it in their teaching. Um, thank you very much for listening.